Hi everyone, and welcome to our virtual lessons. In this opportunity, we will be discussing the scientific method, characteristics, and organizations of life, and also examples of what is a controlled experiment. The scientific method dates to a thousand years ago, and it was originated in a place called Basrak, Iraq, by Ibn al-Haytham. Ibn al-Haytham was a philosopher and a scientist in search for the truth. He dedicated his life to gathering information that will explain its world around him. And it was because of this obsession with the truth that had even a hasten that later on we came to have what we call the scientific method. The scientific method, it's a procedure to gather observations, to gather data, and to make conclusions based on this data. The scientific method begins with making observations. What do I see? What do I experience that I cannot explain? This information can be from one's own experiences, his thoughts, or readings. It doesn't matter where they come from, as long as we find something to investigate. After we make these observations, we proceed of thinking interesting questions. Why does that occur? in order for us to formulate a hypothesis or a possible explanation to the observation that we just saw. And some of the good questions for a hypothesis would be, what are the causes of the phenomenon that I am wondering about? Why did that happen? After the hypothesis, we move on to develop testable predictions. If my hypothesis is correct, then I expect this and that and that other thing. We are trying to predict what is the explanation of the phenomenon that we just observed. And that's what we call the experiment phase of the scientific method. The results of that experiment is the data. And that data we need to gather it in order to, for us to make our own conclusions. Relevant data can come from literature, new observations, or formal experiments. Thorough testing requires a replication to verify now. A very important aspect of the scientific method is that it has to be reproducible. Other scientists have to be able to replicate our work in order to find the same things that we did. If we don't get the data that support our hypothesis, we have to move back to the scientific method. So we have to refine, alter, expand, or reject that hypothesis. We have to come up with a new explanation. We have to develop a new experiment and we have to gather new data based on that experiment. After we finally get the data that supports our idea, we develop general theories. And general theories must be consistent with most or all available data and with other current theories. They have to be backed up by previous discoveries. All those steps together, it's the modern version of what even al Haytham proposed 1,000 years ago, and we use this to explain the world around us. After the scientific method, this is a biology course, so it's only logical that we discuss the characteristics of life. And there are seven main characteristics that living organisms have. All organisms have to have these seven characteristics in order for them to be considered alive. And these are growth, this are reproduction, this is heredity, homeostasis, metabolism, cellular, structure and composition, and they have to respond to the environment. So let's explain each one of them in a little bit more detail. Growth and development refers to when an organism has to develop, it has to grow in size, it has to grow in number, just like the plant that we have over here, it starts with just a little plant, and as it matures, it keeps developing and growing into an adult plant. All organisms, no matter how many cells they have, they have to be born and they have to develop. Reproduction. There are two main types of reproduction. Asexual reproduction, which means that the organism by itself can multiplicate its numbers. And we have sexual reproduction in which two sides of the genetic information are needed in order for a new organism to be born, just like the case of human beings. 
the heredity or the genetic code. Every organism in the world has to have a blueprint or instruction on how to make another one similar to that organism. And generity, generity or genetic code, it's the base of the subtle changes that would eventually lead on to the evolution of species. Internal balance, it's what we call homeostasis. Every organism has to have the means to balance out the effects of the environment on us. If we are hungry, we need to eat. If we are cold, we need to warm up. If we are too hot, we need to lower our temperature in order to re-establish our internal balance. If an organism cannot control its internal balance, it will eventually die and become extinct. The use of energy or metabolism. Every organism needs energy in order to survive. The main source of energy for every living thing in our planet is the sun. Every organism has to have a way, a process, or a pattern in which to use the energy of the sun. In the case of the humans, we eat plants, and plants at the same time use the energy of the sun to produce photosynthesis and fix the energy that is bestowed upon us. All organisms are made of cells. Some organisms are made of just one cell, and we call those unicellular organisms, while other organisms, like ourselves, are composed of billions of different cells in our body. Organisms respond to stimuli. We can see a plant shifting its structure to face the light. Other organisms, like dog, they salivate when they see food. We humans, we respond to danger, and we respond comfortably to good conditions. An example of a controlled experiment, and this is the bread and butter of the scientific community. Through experiments, we are able to prove our hypothesis and construct new theories, the ones that explain the natural world. In this example, we have a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. That is a bacteria that causes inter intestinal ulcers. Investigators want to test a new antibiotic to treat against this bacteria. The first thing is to develop a hypothesis, and that hypothesis would be that the antibiotic B, the newly discovered antibiotic, it's better for treating this disease than antibiotic A. So they set up an experiment. And to set up a functional experiment, we need to have in mind that we need two different groups of subjects to test. A control group, which is the subjects which ulcers are not treated with any antibiotic. And this will be our comparison group. Test group, it's the one that is going to be administered with the new drug. In this case, the test group 1 is the subject treated with antibiotic A. Test group 2 is subjects treated with antibiotic B. And depending on the result, we will compare them to the control group to test the effectivity of the new drug being tested. Sometimes in control experiments, the use of a placebo is fundamental. The placebo is a treatment that resembles the real drug, but does not contain any of the medication just to eliminate bias and suggestions on the participants of the experiment. Depending on the results, the conclusions are made. If the antibiotic A works better than the antibiotic B, then the hypothesis is going to have to be rejected and a new hypothesis has to be made, or we have to conclude that the antibiotic B, the newly discovered antibiotic, is just not better than the previous antibiotic that was being used to treat Helicobacter pylori. After these experiments, let's discuss levels of organizations in our planet. And this is a logical order in which we organize everything that it is in the surface of the Earth. We begin with the atom, the smallest particle of an element that remains the properties of that element. The atom is the simplest thing. It is not considered to be alive. It's just a small portion of matter rearranged in a certain way with certain characteristics. And some examples are hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. All of these were created in the Big Bang explosion. When atoms get together, they form molecules. And examples of those are water, glucose or sugar, and DNA. 
At the same time, these molecules get together to form cells, the smallest unit of life. Very important for us to make a distinction. The atoms are the smallest unit of matter. Atoms are not alive. A cell is the smallest unit of life and considered to be alive. When cells get together, they form tissues. When tissues get together, they form organs. When organs get together, they form organ systems. From there on, we have multicellular organisms, and they live together as a population. And in those populations, together, we have species, communities, ecosystems. And the largest level of organization in our planet is everything that is living under the same roof and that we call the biosphere. Every living thing is organized in kingdoms. And there are five kingdoms that we are going to be discussing. The first of the kingdom are bacteria, unicellular organisms, very primitive, very simple, and some think that they could be the precursors of all life on Earth. Then we have protists, they could be unicellular organisms or they could be multicellular organisms. They're growing up in complexity and can include even some type of plant resembling organisms. Fungi is one of the kingdoms that we have here in our planet. Very similar to plants and we all know different plants. These are the organisms that harvest the energy of the sun to transfer that energy all around the food chain. And finally, we have the animals, or the more complex organisms in our planet. And it is between these five categories that we can categorize every living thing in our planet. The taxonomy levels of organization, it's some type of ladder that organizes organisms depending on different characteristics. And as we move, both move down on this ladder, the more specific the characteristics become. And that helps us to organize and classify and give names to the organisms of Earth. It begins with everything that is alive, moving up to a domain. That moves up to the kingdoms we just discussed. Film, class, order, family, genus, and finally, a species. Here we can see them all together, and we use this to organize, classify, and name every organism on Earth. A summary for this lesson: for this lesson, we discuss what the scientific method is, including observations, hypothesis, experimentation, conclusion, and shared results. We discuss the characteristics of living things the level of organization from the atom all the way up to the biosphere, the five kingdoms of living things, and we saw an experiment, and an example of an experiment.